you know, when it's... <clears throat> Okay, today is uh, 4 September 2007. We are at the uh, Henry Johnson Charter School in Albany, New York. Uh, the interviewers are Wayne Clark and Eric Stock, and uh, we are interviewing Mr. William Turner. And Mr. Turner, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date of birth, please? William Andrew Turner. I was born May 28th. 1937. Okay, and whereabouts were you born? Montgomery, Alabama. Okay, and uh, did you attend school there? Uh, not in Alabama because uh, I left there when I was three years old, mm -hmm. and from Montgomery, Alabama, we moved to the state of Missouri, a little place called, interestingly enough, Gobla, Missouri, and that's where I went to school. Okay, and did you complete high school? I started, didn't complete high school in Missouri, and uh, because we left the state of Missouri, 1955, came to Troy, New York, and I went one year uh, to school in, in Troy, I was a junior in high school in Troy, mm -hmm. Troy High School, and during the summer, I was really, I, I, I was bored. Mm -hmm. There was nothing to do. So I went to my father, and I told my father I wanted to join the Marine Corps. Well, in my family, uh, my father was a World War I veteran. He was, he was in the same, on the same ships that Henry Johnson was on, you know, the uh, American Expeditionary Forces. Mm -hmm. He was one of the, the persons aboard those ships. So <clears throat> I said I wanted to join the Marine Corps, and he was a little surprised, a little taken aback by that. So he said, son, don't you realize that's one of the toughest outfits in the, in the Marine Corps? I said, I don't care. I want to join the Marine Corps. So he said, well, go ahead, join the Marine Corps, but make sure you're able to get back home. <laughs> so that's when I joined the Marine Corps. I was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought I had really made a mistake when I got to Paris Island, South Carolina. Uh, July 29th, 1956, and uh, then I determined that uh, they were not going to break me, and I wanted my father to be very proud of me by going through 13 weeks of boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina, and that's where today, you know, I still remember it. It's, I'm 70 years old now, mm -hmm. and I still remember every incident that occurred uh, when I uh, arrived at Paris Island, South Carolina. So it must have been pretty tough training? It was very tough. Mm -hmm. uh, we arrived in the University of South Carolina, a small place, by train from Albany. And um, when uh, the drill instructor came aboard, he made us acutely aware of what we were going to go through. And when we were transported by bus, it was called a Palometto bus line, to this island, Paris Island, South Carolina, we had to sit out in this, it was hot, very hot and humid. And we had to sit out on the pavement at night, early in the morning, oh, five, six, seven hours, just sitting there. And then we were called inside and we were, we were inducted into this we call it the horror show <laughs> of Paris Island, South Carolina. And uh, the drill instructors pre uh, presented themselves as though this was really going to be your horror show for 13 weeks. And uh, we were, especially myself, I was determined, no matter what, to make it through this. And from the very beginning, from the time we, we went to receiving, as they called it, we got our 782 gear, you know, canteen cartridge mm -hmm. belts and all that stuff. And the drill instructor spotted me and he wanted, I guess he wanted to make an example of, of something, of me. So he threw me on the deck, put his foot on my chest, and he asked me, uh, where are you from? 
Well, they, they call you really negative names, you know, uh, to impugn your integrity. So he said, uh, where are you from? I said, Troy, New York. Oh, we have a New York hoodlum on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> so he really, he really set the standard. He set the pace right there. And then I knew when I was laying on the deck, he had his foot on my chest. And I said, there's no way on this earth is he going to make me quit. And that, that, that day or that morning, he really reinforced and set my character for me about the military. Mm -hmm. And ever since that time in my life, now it's 50 plus years later, I still have that, that military, you know, that warrior type attitude about everything. About, I think that with every young male today that's walking around with nothing to do, should just take it on himself to just volunteer. I mean, there's never going to be another draft. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that for the benefit of that individual, if he doesn't go to school and he drops out, he should go and join the military because they have dropped all of these barriers that were there before. You had to be out of high school, you had to do this, that, that. Well, now they've dropped even misdemeanor charges against you to go to join the service. Mm -hmm. And I think these young people should take advantage of that because in the end, in the end, it would make a better person out of them. I feel that way, personally, because from the time I joined the Marine Corps to the time that I got out of the Marine Corps, I still maintain that character. They instill that hardcore military status in you, but by the same token, they build character. The military builds your character. It instills pride in yourself. You know, you, you, you like what you do, you like what they put you through. You, you really can pat yourself on the back when you graduate from boot camp and you get the uniform on and your drill instructor tells you, you are now a U.S. Marine. When they tell you, when they speak that one word to you, that you are a U.S. Marine, it just does things to you that you would never forget. You see, and I think, I talked to an ex-Marine uh, not too long ago, and he said, Bill, he said, when I graduated Paris Island, and that was on the Vietnam thing, so when I graduated from PI, and that drill instructor told me, now you are a U.S. Marine, he said that was one of the proudest days of my life. So just by that alone, it tells you that no matter who you are, or what background, environment you come from, if you go, if you just go, go and get into the military, it will change your life for the better. And I still appreciate that to this very day. After your basic training, uh, whereabouts did you go, or did you stay? Camp Lejeune. Okay. Camp Lejeune. And my platoon. And we were all gathered in that concert hut. And uh, the gunny sergeant and the captains and the lieutenants were standing outside. And they take a, each person, each Marine out, and ask them, what do you want to be? When I said to, to my uh, gunny sergeant, I want to be an engineer, you know, driving the big heavy equipment. He said, stand up, Marine. I stood up. How tall are you? Six feet tall. He said, you will be a, a military policeman. What? He said, you will be a uh, military policeman. So that's, I went with uh, two MOSs, one 0311, one 0300. One uh, was still a, was a, a ground pounder, mm -hmm. but by the same token, I was a military policeman, divisional MP, which meant that that was the 0311. I went everywhere the Navy went, you know, they, if I go, I went to Panama, I went to Puerto Rico, I went to several places, went to Havana, Cuba, all those places, spending three months in the, in the jungles with, uh, they call it simulated warfare, and uh, it was scary, but, you know, ships, storms, mm -hmm. you know, coming back from, from uh, that three months out in the jungles of uh, Panama, we were on our way back to Camp Lejeune, 
He ran into one of those storms off of uh, Cape Hatteras. And it was one of the worst experiences I've ever had. And I got seasick from that. And every time I go into choppy water, I still get seasick. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I had a chance to travel, to go to places that you would normally not go. A 19 year old, not, you know, so I had the chance to travel, see different uh, societies, different cultures, and uh, it helped today being a civilian is to be able to meld into different cultures, know the different cultures. And that's why I say military, for the young people, person today, can go out into the world because the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, even the National Guard will take you places where you never go, different cultures, and you will realize that you can go here and there, that cultures, you can meld the cultures, you can, you can understand the cultures, you can see how they work, and understand that your culture is not the only one, but there are many, numerous cultures out there that you can learn from, mm -hmm. which would make also, in my opinion, would make a better person out of you. Now your uh, training as a military policeman, uh, how long was that school, do you recall? That was because we, what we needed to do was know how to police the street. Because as a divisional MP, when you go overseas, you are the person that's designated to go into the streets and walk patrol to control your people. Mm -hmm. And we were taught or trained how to walk down the street, what to look for, and how to, to control your emotions. And the, the biggest problem with being a military policeman or a regular policeman is being able to control your emotions. So what the provost marshal, who is in control of all MPs, would tell you that when you're out there patrolling the streets and you have to take care of your Marines, you make sure you control your temper and don't let your temper get the best of you because you know that when your Marines are drunk, they will do dumb things. And you must learn to control them. You must know how to disarm them, which, which means that they're going to be very combative. Like, like when you go to a bar and there's curfew, you walk into a bar and you say, hey guys, curfew is, 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 in, is in vogue now. You have to go back to the vehicle and, and catch the vehicle and go back to the base. So here's a scenario. You and your partner walk into the bar and they got four or five beers on the bar. He says, hey, uh, they call the, uh, the military for post. Hey, post, listen, we have beer here. We're, okay, here's what we'll do. Me and my partner will walk around We'll check out the rest of the bar, and we come back with the beer off. So when we come back into the bar, they've got six or seven more bottles of beer in the bar. So you know that things are going to be tough here, so you have to figure out a strategy. And you tell the bartender, bartender, I want you to take every bottle of beer on that bar off and dump them. But they paid for it, I don't care. When we were here first, I told you, curfew. You weren't supposed to serve these guys any more beer. So you serve the beer, you go out of the line. So he dumps the beer. These guys get up uppity and they want to take us on. So you just simply, you gesture. So you got a loaded weapon here. You don't take it out. You don't pull the weapon out of your, your holster. You just put your hand on it and says, look, you got five minutes to get out the door. Five minutes. When they see you mean business, they will walk out. But you never lost control by saying, you, 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 you start smacking people around, push me. You never do that. But you gesture to them that you mean business. And they look and see that you mean what you say, that you have backup. <laughs> so they adhere to your demands. Did you ever encounter any uh, real problems? I mean, where you had to. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, we had to take a belligerent Marine to, we had established uh, a precinct, like a police station. Mm -hmm. So we had to take this belligerent Marine to Sergeant Guard, 
we take him in, and you have staff sergeant and gunny sergeant sitting behind the desk, like like you guys are sitting there, and you've got the marine standing here. You have a military policeman here and there. And what he does is when he's questioned why he's belligerent, why he's acting up, he reaches over and he punches the sergeant. I mean, he literally he punches him, knocks him out of the chair. And uh, the sergeant says, get that man. So we build the clubs and we start smacking him around a little bit. <laughs> Which we were out of order, but that's what he said, get the man. So the next day, Colonel came up, knocked on our tents. We stepped outside, and he said, "If any of you Marines ever hit another one of my Marines, I'll lock all of you up." That that was really, that was. But I don't care. You can subdue that man, subdue that man without hitting him with your clubs. We learned from there that from there on in, if you have a confrontation. With a belligerent marine, you just literally take him down mm -hmm. without having to smack him around a little bit. So that was that was serious business right there, because mm -hmm. we could have gotten it, we could have been in the brig, but it worked out okay. <laughs> okay, and um, now how long were you a military policeman from, from, that, the, from the that day forward? The, yeah, from that day forward. Mm -hmm. At uh, that was Camp Lejeune where we were. We were given our assignments. We just gotten out of uh, boot camp, and uh, they set our assignments up. Our divisions. I was uh, MP Company Headquarters Battalion, Second Marine Division, FMF Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Never forget it. <laughs> now, uh, I didn't notice on your application. I didn't look. <clears throat> uh, that training as a military policeman, did, did, were you able to put that to use uh, once you got out of the military? I tried to. I, um, when I came out of the Marine Corps, I went to test for the New York State Police. Mm -hmm. And uh, by being in the military, they give you a five point preference, five points right off. So when I took the test, I scored a 95, so that gives me 100. Mm -hmm. But when I took that test, 1959, 1960, there was 5,000 military, ex-military service guys to, that took that test. I passed the test, waited for the call, they called me. I was sitting at home, married, and working for Ford Motor Company, Green Island. Phone rang. Bill Turner, yes. We were just going through all of our records here, and we see that you took the state police test back in 1960. I said, yes, I did. And we see you scored 100 on it with your preference. Yes, I did. Are you still interested in the New York State Police? Yes, but I think I'm too old. He said, well, we should make that determination. How old are you? Forty-nine. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> so when I took the test, I think it was, I got out in fifty-eight, fifty-nine, sixty. So I was twenty-one when I got out of the Marine Corps. So that was twenty plus years later. They called you after twenty years. Plus years, yeah. Oh my God! He said, "You know, the cutoff point was twenty-nine. You know, uh -huh. And I said, "Well, I'm forty-nine." <laughs> I said. Would you, would you like, I said, yeah, I said, well, I'd love to be a New York State Police, but I'm just too old now. I mean, physically, I could have, because I always stayed in shape, mm -hmm. physically, I could have joined police, state police, and, but I was just too old. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what did you do once you got out of the military? Well, I worked for, worked in several jobs. I worked for Republic Steel, Troy. Uh, first, let me ask you, did you make use of the GI Bill? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, yes. But um, when did I make use of that? Buying a house, buying a buying. But I worked for Republic Steel for six years. And a friend of mine worked for Ford Motor Company, Green Island. And uh, usually this time of year, the uh, steel mill shuts down because it's too hot. Mm -hmm. So 
I was joining, uh, unemployment, and he said, he called me on the phone, he said, Sonny, Ford Motor Company is hiring. I go, really? Yeah. So I went over and talked with them. But in the meantime, I had I'd gone on to GE for looking for a job. So I took the test, and uh, GE said, we'll call you in a week. And then he called me and told me about Ford employing, being, uh, employing people. So I went over to Ford, filled out the application, answered all the questions. Do you want to go to work today? I said, well, I can't work today, but I can come back tomorrow. So come back tomorrow, 8 o'clock in the morning. So I went to work for Ford. A week later, GE said, you got a job. I said, I don't need one now. <laughs> so I worked for Ford Motor Company for 23 and a half years. And uh, when Ford Motor Company closed that plant in Green Island, they, they were shipping that particular uh, production to Mexico. And the union negotiated a contract that you have to do something about these employees because you're shipping their work to a foreign country. Mm -hmm. So Ford Motor Company set up a situation where if you wanted to retire, if you're 50, you can retire. I was 52. So I retired at age 52. And they said, well, if you want to go back to school, we'll pay for it. So I elected to go back to school. So I'd already graduated high school, I got a GED, mm -hmm. and um, I went to Maria College for physical therapy, and I graduated from Maria College in 1992 at age 55, and uh, the job market, that's, that's, the, that's the, the promising thing about an education, age 55, graduated, I could do physical therapy, but the paperwork was just too much for me. But then another job opened up at uh, Michigan High School, and an assistant athletic trainer. So I applied for that. I got that. I worked there for seven years. And uh, I had the opportunity to work with a young man by the name of Andre Davis. You've heard of him. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, had, when he was, I worked with him when he was about 14, 15 years old. And uh, I was proud, really proud to see a little bit of input with this young mm -hmm. man's life paid off for it. And here again, the value of an education. And when you do that, when you do that, the whole world opens up for you. It's like taking blinkers off. You can go anywhere with an education, a quality education. Go anywhere, talk with anyone, sit down. Because then you'll realize with a quality education, that everyone has something in common. It sounds simple, but it's it's huge. He says, you mean to tell me you can go sit down with you two guys? We have a lot in common, but we gotta meet each other and step over those, what some people call barriers, which there isn't any, it's the barriers that you create in your mind. Mm -hmm. Step over those barriers, and we have so much in common. You find out that if we weren't sitting here with this interview, talking, you and I could go out Sit down over beer and we could talk for hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, gee, I think that we pretty much uh, covered your, your military experience. Um, and I, th I think normally we, we end uh, the interview by saying, how do you think the military has changed or affected your life? But I think you pretty much covered that. It uh, was a very big part of your life, even though it was it was just for was it four two, years? Two years. Two years. Yeah, but just that short period of time it affected mm -hmm. it. And for example, my brother, after I got out, he went into the Marine Corps. To show you how now, my brother is my youngest brother is sixty-seven years old. He still walks around in his military outfit, you know, the, the, the gray stuff, the green stuff, the hat. He still wears the, uh, the Lance Corporal stripe on his hat. Well, he, he has a lot of stuff on his chest. He's the Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. He has the battlefield commission because he was in Vietnam in Quang Tri province. That's where he got wounded there. Mm -hmm. And when they gave him the discharge, the disability discharge, he did not want it. He wanted to go back. He said, Mr. Turner, you can't go back. It affected him so much 
because he could not stay in the Marine Corps, that he could not go back to the Marine Corps, that he just went on a reckless bent. You know, he just, he, I, I did everything I could to control him. Just to, he was just angry. He was just absolutely angry because what it had done for him, how it had changed him, just it directed his life, focused his life, disciplined his life. Now they're taking that away. They're taking that focus and that discipline away from him. He didn't like that. Mm -hmm. And for a couple of years, he wouldn't take his medication, you know, the Dilantin and uh, phenobarbital to keep the seizures away. And he'd go through seizures and I'd tell him, look, you just can't do this. You can't do this. You, you, you're out of the Marine Corps. I don't want to be out. You're out of the Marine Corps, please. You know, get your head together. So, because I, I stayed close to him, counseled him, finally got him to face reality that your life has changed now. You are a civilian. I'll never be a civilian. That is so true with him today. And deep down in his heart, that he's still a warrior. The same applies to me. He's still a warrior. Mm -hmm. he ne that never goes away. And when the Marines said to you, to oh, a few good men, that is exactly what they mean. They will break you down, literally break you down, and build you up. And once they build you up, you'll never toss that in the garbage can. That is forever. <laughs> Thanks to the hoorah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. I just love talking about it. <laughs>